Special thanks to Stumbling Tours super sponsors Schumann 3D Blast, Shine Wolf, Ministry of Ennui Control, Metric Conversion, Rune Fox, Thingy, Lemon314, and Lord Entropy. Visit David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. In November, I started up Transport Tycoon Deluxe again so that I could talk about it for a podcast by DOS Game Club. This turned out to be a dangerous move as I have now got hopelessly addicted to it again and have wasted my entire week. The game has a ton of simulation elements under the surface, not just about the vehicles you own, but about how your actions affect the world, like the growth of towns and industries, and how town councils react to your construction. As I played more of it, I found myself wanting to know more about how the game thinks underneath. I'm a great fan of the Roller Coaster Tycoon videos by Marcel Vos, where he very interestingly explains parts of the game that I never even realised I wanted to know about. I was hoping to find something equivalent for Transport Tycoon, but I couldn't, so I decided to open it up and find out the answers to some of my questions for myself. In these videos, I won't be looking at the actual assembly that the original game was written in, but the open source remake OpenTTD, which started out based on the same code, and I'll try to mention if I find anything that's significantly different from the original game. In Transport Tycoon, you're given a generated world studded with towns and industries, and your only objective is to make an obscene amount of money by transporting passengers and various kinds of cargo from one place to another. To that end, you have four forms of transport available – road vehicles, trains, ships and aircraft, though trains are unapologetically the main focus of the game. You move cargo around by directing these vehicles to pick things up and drop them off at stations that you also have to build, with things like airports and docks also counting as stations for our purposes. When you put a station down, the game will give it a name like Tenbridge Central or Mudworth Transfer, and the first thing I wanted to look into was how these names are chosen. In OpenTTD's code, the decisions around station names are handled in the station command file, with most of the important parts in a function called GenerateStationName. When the player builds anything that can become part of a station, the game first checks to see if it can add this new part to a station that already exists. If it can't, then it needs to create a new station and find something suitable to name it. First, the game looks for the town that happens to be closest to the station's tile. Towns are, of course, collections of buildings and roads that can be spread over dozens of tiles, but underneath they each have just one tile that counts as their town centre. This tile can be identified by looking at where the town's name is displayed on the map, or the place that the viewport centres over when you open the town window. This is the only tile the game looks for when making the closest town search. In the same way, stations that cover multiple tiles, such as railway stations and airports, also have just one tile that counts in searches like this. It's always the northernmost diamond that the station occupies. For large towns that have spread out far from their original location towards another town centre, this means a built station can sometimes be assigned to a town that you didn't expect. Having got the name of the town that the station belongs to, the more complex part begins which is deciding on what to add to the town name to make the station name. Each time a new station is built, the game starts with a list of 24 potential names and then eliminates them as it goes, eventually choosing one when a condition passes or the one that happens to be closest to the beginning of the list when it's out of ideas. The code actually has the potential to use different strategies for deciding on a name depending on the type of station that's been laid down, and it's possible to follow different paths for road stops, railway stations, airports, heliports and docks. So if someone were to rearrange things, it would be possible to assign different lists of names to railway stations and bus stops, for example. However, in the current implementation, as of December 2021, road and railway station names don't have any difference in how they're worked out, and the rest of the options alter the base strategy only slightly. No matter which strategy is being used, the game first goes through all the stations assigned to the same town and checks which names it's already given out, crossing them off the list. There is one special case here where if the game has used the forest name it will also remove woods from the list. At this point, the type of station that the player has laid down begins to matter, as there are a couple of unique names to consider. If this station is a small or large airport, and the airport name is still available, the game will select that one immediately. In the same way, it will assign the name Docks if it's a dock, and if it's a heliport it will assign the name Heliport. 
no other station types will ever be assigned these names even if all the other possibilities have been eliminated. For road and railway stations, as well as the other stations if their preferred names were already taken, there is now a fairly long additional list of decisions. The first of them is to check if the station is near a mine. The game devotes a surprising amount of energy to deciding if something counts as a mine or not, and it's not as simple as just searching for a particular industry. It turns out industries in Transport Tycoon are defined as one of four categories which are called life types. Extractive, which are industries that dig things out of the ground, organic, which are things like farms and forests that are based on plants, processing, which usually require resources from extractive or organic industries and produce different cargo from them, and black holes, which are like processing industries but don't give out a new cargo when their requirements are delivered. The power station is an example of a black hole, and the bank is also counted as one even though it does produce valuables in addition to requesting them. For checking whether a square is part of a mine, the game only considers squares that belong to an extractive industry. There are 13 of these across the four climates that you can choose in the game – oil, rigs and wells, coal, copper, gold, iron and diamond mines, water supplies, and then a few from the Willy Wonka Toyland scenario – cola wells, plastic fountains, bubble generators, toffee quarries and sugar mines. Having got this list, the game then checks to see if the industry produces any cargo that is not passengers' mail or a liquid. This means that the industries that produce oil, water, rubber, cola or plastic get discarded. The remaining industries that count as mines are the coal, copper, gold, iron, diamond and sugar mines, the toffee quarry and the bubble generator. With that list of industries in hand, the game looks at the 7x7 square with the station tile in its centre, and will check to see if two or more of these tiles belong to one of those industries. If they do, and the name Mines hasn't been assigned yet, the game assigns it now. One catch is that just like the issue with town centre tiles I mentioned before, only the area in the square around the northernmost tile of the station is considered. It's possible to put a long station that extends down to near as many mine tiles as you like, and as long as the top corner is out of range, the station will still never be called mines. The mine check is by far the longest of the special cases, and the rest of the checks are much more simple in comparison. The next one goes back to looking at the distance the station is from the town it's assigned to. If it's fewer than 8 tiles away from the town centre tile, then it will just be given the name of the town with no suffix. However, if this name has already been given out, it will append the word central. The actual distance to the centre relative to other stations is never taken into account. The central station name is really just a fallback for when the non-central name is already taken. If these names have both been taken, or the station is too far away to qualify for them, the next check is to see if the station can be called Lakeside. There are two conditions for this, both of which must be true for the name to be applied. The first is that the station tile must have five or more water squares in the same 7x7 grid that the mine check uses. Only clear water squares count, not coastal tiles or those that have depots or locks built onto them. The second condition is more unusual – the station must be fewer than 20 tiles from the edge of the map. This made sense in the original game, where you were always playing on an island surrounded by water, but with the introduction of different map types in Open TTD, it becomes just an arbitrary limitation, as a site in the middle of the map might be far more suitable to be called Lakeside than any place near the map's edge. The game now moves on and checks to see if it can apply the Woods station name. There are two conditions for this again, but this time either one of the conditions being true is enough to qualify. The first is to check the 7x7 grid around the station tile again, and count the number of tiles that contain trees. If it's 8 or more, then the station will be given this name. Alternatively, the station can qualify for this name if two or more tiles in this area belong to a forest industry, in the same kind of check as for the mines before. This time, the game looks for industries of life type organic, which can produce wood as one of their items of cargo. Finally for this check, if the game is set to the desert climate type and the station is about to be assigned the woods name, it will switch to using forest instead. This is the reason that there's a special case for them earlier on. If a forest station has been assigned, then the game doesn't want to be able to also assign a woods. The fifth special check looks at the height of the land the station is on compared to the tile that represents the town centre. If the station's Z coordinate is greater, then the name Heights will be assigned. If it's lower, then the name Valley will be used. If they're at an equal elevation, neither of these applies and the game moves on. 
The last check the game does before bringing out the backups is to look at the X and Y coordinates of the station compared to the town centre, to see if it can justify assigning the name North, South, East or West. The game's isometric viewpoint makes the calculation of this simpler than it might otherwise be, as the X and Y axes actually go diagonally across the screen towards the player's viewpoint. If both the station's X and Y position are below the town's X and Y position, then the station is visually somewhere to the north of the town, and the rest of the cardinal directions are worked out in a similar way. Unlike the other checks so far, for some reason this one doesn't select a name immediately. It just performs some mathematics to strike off the compass points that can't apply to this station, then continues through to the last section. If none of the above cases have selected a name, or those names were already taken, the game is now left with a list of names that aren't associated with any special conditions, plus the one named after a compass point if it hadn't already been used. In order of priority, it will now attempt to assign the compass point name, then transfer, halt, exchange, annex, sidings, branch, then upper and lower town name. Despite the last two sounding like they should have something to do with elevations as well, they have no special checks for them, and are just used in that order once all the other names have been exhausted. Once all of these have been used as well, the code admits defeat, and the next station to be built, without qualifying for any special naming conditions, will just be given a number instead. I've never hit this point in the code during normal play as it requires a huge number of stations to get there, though perhaps it's more common in large multiplayer games or for huge rail networks. More usually, even without using anything but road and rail stations, you would find yourself getting the plain and central names first, accompanied by a couple of the names with specific conditions about the nearby industries if you're building stations near them. Then you would get at least a couple of the cardinal directions and height based names, and you would still have the 8 generic names to get through before you started getting the fallback numbered stations. As well as the five strategies for assigning road, rail, sea, airport and heliport names, there is also a sixth name generator which isn't possible for the player to trigger, and it's used by the game when an oil rig is built. Because there's no room on an oil rig for a player to build their own station, they incorporate a station that's owned by nobody that combines both a heliport and a shipping dock in the same place. To decide on a name for this station, the game uses the exact same technique as if the station had been placed by a player, finding the closest town from the tile, and then asking Generate Station Name to give it a name for an oil rig. This will return the unique name Oilfield for the first oil rig, and will then follow the same rules for falling back to other names if a second oil rig happens to be assigned to the town. One unusual thing to remember with all of this logic is that the game only keeps track of what names it has given out to stations, and doesn't know what the stations in a town are actually named at the moment. If you build a station, then rename it, the game will still remember the name it gave out to that station, and it won't attempt to assign the name again even if you build another station under the exact same conditions. It's only when the original station is completely deleted when it frees up its original assigned name to be used again. This also means that despite the game enforcing the player to name stations uniquely, you can get two stations with the same name by renaming a station to something that you know the game is later going to choose for a second station. The game doesn't check whether a station with a name already exists, it only knows that it hasn't assigned a station that name yet. In addition to all of the decisions I've just gone over, there is also some logic in the code to look for any nearby industries that influence the names of stations. Industries seem to have the option to cause a specific name to be assigned to a station nearby, or just to disable the possibility of the station being called Oilfield or Mines if those happen to be close to the industry. The reason I didn't mention this in the checklist I went through is that no industries in the game use this at all. The station name property is blank for every default industry, and the game's code isn't even set up to allow assigning anything to it even if new industries are defined. The only industries that influence the station's name are the mines and the forests, and both of those are special cases that don't use this logic. It looks like this way of assigning names was part of some mechanic around industries that eventually went in a different direction instead. The code here looks like it would have caused stations to have an industry type assigned to them, and they would possibly have then only been able to service that one industry. The way the game really works, a station can always send and receive cargo on behalf of anything that happens to provide a request it within the station's catchment area. 
So that is how stations are named in Transport Tycoon. To wrap up, I will continue my Marcel Vos impression by saying that if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like, subscribe, or leave a comment. Particularly if you have any questions yourself about how this fascinating game works, I'd be glad to at least attempt to answer them. Thank you to everyone on the left here for supporting me creating Stumbling Tours videos. If you'd like to join in or make suggestions for other games to cover, please have a look at David X. Newton on Patreon.